This is part two. What about the distribution of the compressive stress I create with my bolts? Well, we know that compressive stress spreads out material something like a 45 degree angle, sort of a 45 degree cone. So we design our proportions such that the compressive stress tends to overlap. And of course, we want to make sure that the compressive stress goes all the way to the edge of our joint interface. Here I have refined my finite element model to include the detail of the neck joint. I include the effect of the bolt forces, the holes, the counterbores. I apply the 500 pounds to the bottom of the counterbore and I compute the stresses. I want to include this little slanted portion of the body to allow, that allows musicians to freely access the upper frets. That little break just actually makes it more ergonomic. It allows your hand to reach up to the upper frets more easily, and it makes it a nice and smooth feeling to it. So how much can I break that corner is the question. In my first design iteration, I'm, going to, I'm getting compressive stresses, which are in blue, everywhere but that one corner where the neck is still trying to lift on me. I have 110 PSI of tensile stress lifting in that corner. However, on the right image, if I increase the material a little bit from 0.44 inches to 0.57 inches, about an eighth of an inch added material, I get more spreading of the bolt forces and I have at least 80 PSI of compressive stress everywhere on the joint. So this small change of an eighth of an inch of added material changed my result from slight separation to actual compression everywhere. So by carefully designing and analyzing this neck joint, I'm confident that I will have full compression when the body and the neck, between the body and the neck, and I can be certain that the two members will behave vibrationally as if they were completely one connected, one structural system. Now that I've designed the instrument, I can begin building. I'm not going to go into detail here on the actual fabrication, but as you can see, it's pretty involved. There are many steps. I use my router quite a bit. I also do a lot of the carving by hand with rasps and sandpaper. I also learned how to spray and work the lacquer finish. That was actually the hardest part, I would say. I built a little spray booth in my basement, and I end up with a finished product shown in the lower right-hand corner, which you can see it's really satisfying to go through this whole process and end up with an instrument. Sometimes I have to become a manufacturing engineer. For this particular guitar shown here, the body is actually made of two different kinds of woods, top and bottom, mahogany and maple, and here I glue the two pieces together. I've designed and built a clamping fixture, and the body is shown in the picture, being clamped and glued together. Um, it has massive bolts, where I clamped the two pieces of wood together with 54,000 pounds or 27 tons of force, pushing them together during the gluing process. Okay, so now that we've made the guitar, let's talk about the vibration and the sound that we can make with it. If you pluck a guitar string, it vibrates at certain natural frequencies, which correspond to the mode shapes that are shown. The first mode shape is just a bowing overall from one end to the other. The second one is split in half. The third mode is in three parts and so on. Theoretically, there's an infinite number of mode shapes of a guitar string vibration. This is well-known string theory vibration theory. Some questions I'd like to answer are, which string modes are important for the sound we're trying to achieve? In what way does the structural vibration of the guitar, the neck and the body, affect the vibration of the string? How about the vibration of the body itself? We have mounted these sensors on it, and if it vibrates, we vibrate the sensor, and that will contribute, right? Okay, we're getting a little more technical here. But in order to understand our guitar and what type of signal output we want to achieve, we'll have to understand something about sound. Here I'm showing the chain where the guitar produces the electrical signal. It's amplified by an amplifier. It's sent through a voice coil actuator called a speaker which produces an acoustic pressure field in the air, which is picked up by your ear. We want to know something about the sound pressure field and how our ear responds to it. Here we have the acoustic wave energy. If we solve this wave equation, it will come as no surprise to you that the solution is a sine wave. And this 1D solution here is a function of time and space. 
And we are interested in some overall magnitude of this field, which represents the loudness, so that we can do take a root mean square of that pressure field, and that gives us an overall indication of the magnitude of the sound that we are generating. Well, this root mean square pressure magnitude is actually a quite tricky number to deal with because it can vary from very small to very large. And our ear is a wonderful sensor. It can, be, it can hear very loud noise pressure fields and it can hear very quiet ones. In fact, the sensory response of our ear is logarithmic. And it, so it attenuates very loud noises and it allows very quiet noises to come through and still be heard. As an aside note, I recently learned that our, sensor, our sense of sight perceives brightness and also our sense of touch are both also logarithmic. To deal with this issue of soft and, lo and loud noises, we generally convert the PRMS pressure field magnitude to decibels. It's simple, simply the log base 10 of our PRMS divided by a reference pressure of 20 micropascals, which is just the reference pressure by which the dB is defined, dB being decibel. For every 10 decibels increase in the sound level, the apparent loudness to our ear doubles. So for every dB higher, the sound doubles. It's just something that you're gonna have to keep in mind as you watch some of these uh, plots that I'm going to present. Unfortunately, we can't even stop there. The response of our ears is also dependent on the frequency of the sound they are receiving. For human hearing, there's a sweet spot for the frequencies between about 500 hertz and 8 kilohertz. Anything outside that range, there's a drop off. The first plot on the left illustrates the range of amplitude and frequency that our ears are capable of sensing. Speech is typically right in the middle of this range, 100 hertz to 4 kilohertz. Music extends that, depending on if you are at home listening or at a rock concert, but in the plot on the right, we've attempted to quantify the effect of frequency on the apparent loudness using a weighting curve. This A curve, the blue one, is actually the one typically most used for industrial noise weighting. We can see that the, a sound occurring at 100 hertz has about 20 dB less impact on us than one at one kilohertz. So in other words, we need to make this 100 hertz pressure field about 20 dB stronger to have the same apparent loudness as one that's occurring at one kilohertz, 1000 hertz. From one kilohertz to eight kilohertz, we're good, but then above eight kilohertz, our hearing starts to drop off again. So now that we have a little better understanding of sound, what a dB is, what frequencies we're looking for, let's back up for a second. Let's think about what we're doing here. We take our hand and perhaps using a pick, to strum the strings of our guitar produces an electrical signal. We amplify it, we send it through a voice coil speaker. This generates an acoustic field and our listener hears it with his ear. This, in this signal chain, which of these do you think influence the sound field? All of these things can dramatically change the sound that is being produced. This is actually an extremely complicated subject, but I choose here to focus the attention on the signal, the signal from the guitar. And so from here on out, that's all I'm going to talk about is this signal. But keep in mind that the rest of this stuff also dramatically affects the sound pressure field. So we wanna look at the signal coming from the guitar. How do we do that? We can put it through a high-speed data acquisition system, pluck the guitar and record the signal. We get something that looks like this. I'm plotting voltage versus time. And you can see that it looks very periodic, but it also really looks like it's a possibly a combination of sine waves of various frequencies added together. The primary period, the biggest one here, its period is 0 0.00303 seconds. Well, one over that number is corresponds to 329.6 Hertz. This corresponds exactly to the first mode frequency of the string that we just plucked. So that's a good sign. When you do the data acquisition and you record it and you look at the primary wavelength and you go one over it and it equals the frequency you were expecting, you're happy. But what about the rest of that information that's in that signal? How do we make sense of all of that? Well, 
what we can do is take that signal and do a Fourier transform to convert it from the time domain to the frequency domain. So here I'm plotting the amplitude as a function of the frequency. You can see that we have our largest amplitude at 329.6 Hertz. The next peak is exactly twice that frequency. Then the next one is three times, four times, etc. This is exactly what we expect based on string theory that we talked about. The first peak corresponds to the first mode, which is a bow, and it has the highest amplitude. The second, the third, each corresponds to a certain shape of the string vibration. But after four kilohertz or so, we don't really see anything. Remember what I was saying, that our ears are very sensitive and can pick up on large and small amplitudes. We may be missing a lot of the information up in the four kilohertz and above range. So what do we do? We do the same thing with this signal that we did with the sound pressure. We convert the spectral amplitude plot to decibels by taking the log of the amplitude. Now we can see the large amplitudes below four kilohertz and we can see the peaks that are coming out at the higher frequencies. Remember what we said about how every 10 decibels the loudness doubles. So above four kilohertz the amplitude drops off considerably. But if we remove this information our ears would know it. Remember also what we said about low frequency sound that our ears aren't going to hear well below one kilohertz. Not as well as they do above one kilohertz. So we have to think about that when we look at this plot. So what we have here, what you're looking at, is our best attempt at a signal analysis. The distribution of these peaks, those individual peaks, one, two, three, four, five, six, it gives us an indication of the tone of the guitar. So what do I, what do I mean by tone? <clears throat> Let's say two people sing the same note. It's the same frequency, right? one person will sound very different than the other and I bet you can tell the difference. I bet if I sang a note or Adele sang the note, I bet you could readily tell the difference even if we were singing the exact same note. Why is that? Why can you tell the difference? How can you tell the difference if they're singing the same bass frequency? Well, if you only had that first bass frequency, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the two of us singing. It's all that other content that differentiates the tone, and that's what we call tone. It's all these added peaks above the first frequency that makes our guitar sound so good, so rich, so colorful. Many of the great instruments like the guitar, the piano, are stringed instruments, and it's because our ears appreciate all of these multitudes of peaks that are created by this dancing string. And so what we have here in this last plot is a very simplified version of what our brain does in real time. So what can we do with this tool? If we just look at one plot, it's interesting, but what does it mean? Well, we can start using the tool to look for differences and try to gain an understanding of how, how these frequency plots relate to what we're hearing. In this example, we have two different sensor locations on the guitar, two different pickups. One pickup is near the bridge where the string is pinned and one is near the neck and by flipping a switch I can change the output signal from the guitar to be from one pickup or, to, or from the other. So here is the output from each of these two. It's the same string vibration but we get a different output signal. Remember the 10 dB rule. With the neck pickup the first few mo modes are huge right and compared to the rest of them the first few modes are much larger than the rest of them. Whereas the bridge pickup here, uh, they're really important out to about 35, about 3.5 kilohertz, 3,500 hertz or so. And if you're a guitar player, you were expecting this result. The bridge pickup on the neck sounds shrill. It sounds cutting or biting. It bites into your ears. That's the higher frequencies. The neck pickup sounds more smooth and mellow. That's because the lower frequency modes are more dominant. There's still high frequency modes there with the neck pickup, but the first few are dominant. Also, there's a glaring weird thing in this plot, in the top plot. 
Where is the fourth mode? It's barely evident or maybe not even evident. You can count one, two, three, but the fourth one is missing and then the fifth one appears. Why is that? It does, why does it not exist? So we can understand that if we look at the location of the sensor and we look at the mode shapes of the string. So count them out. The first one is the bow. The second one is cut in half. The third one, well, the fourth one, the node of that mode shape corresponds to approximately where the neck, put, neck pickup lies, the top pickup in that picture. The fourth node, the node of the fourth mode string of the string vibration is right corresponding to the sensor location. And that's why there's no amplitude of that vibration at that location. And that's why the fourth mode is is missing in the top plot, but it's evident in the bottom plot. Cool, huh? Please go to part three.